Okay, I want to welcome everybody to the last webinar in our series um, of four. So today we're going to talk about the potential hidden dangers of personal care products. Um, my name is Kate Winovec. I'm a senior environmental health and safety specialist here at the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Hopefully you've had a chance to join us on some of the earlier webinars that we've done. We're going to follow the same format about an hour uh, presentation and then about 30 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions um, that come up as we go along or if you want to wait until the end, please type them in the question box in the, the webinar platform. Um, everybody's telephones are muted and they'll, they will stay muted throughout the duration of the webinar. So we'll go ahead and get started here. So our agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, personal care product safety in the U.S., so how are personal care products actually regulated, uh, the potential environmental health and safety effects of products we have, ingredients of concern, you know, where do you find them, why are they used, why are they a concern. Um, at the end, I have a little piece on kind of children's personal care products, and then we'll talk about eco-friendly products and resources um, for more information. So just like the other webinars in our series, um, this uh, through this Green Homes for Cleaner Lakes series, it is um, sponsored by both the Pollution Prevention Institute and uh, the U.S. EPA through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So really the goal of uh, the webinars and the in-person workshops we did is to, to educate consumers about things we can do at home um, that are affecting water quality. So this map shows the 30 areas of concern in the U.S. Great Lakes Basin, you know, so areas where um, there's been some kind of chemical contamination that has um, endangered either wildlife, people, both, that's somehow affecting water quality. So the ultimate goal, you know, is to um, eliminate or delist these areas of concern. Okay. So just so everyone's kind of on the, the same page when we talk about personal care products, these are the types of products that we're talking about. So anything that could be used to to clean your body, I mean this includes toothpaste, mouthwash, um, hand soap, um, any hair products, shaving products, anything that you might use as a moisturizer, um, nail products, any kind of perfume, really anything that you're going to put on your body um, to wash it or, you know, to, um, yeah, anything used on your body. We'll leave it at that. So these are the, the few things that are required on a personal care product label. Uh, there's two examples here. The, the one on top, on the top right, is um, Dove bar soap. And then the one on the bottom is a picture of, I think it's a Pantene shampoo. Um, so what's required, just quantity, identity, so what's the product, all the things that you would think you know, need to be on there. The ingredients are listed from highest to lowest quantity, so similar to a food label. Um, so whatever you see first kind of has the highest quantity um, in that material, or in that product, I should say. So here in the U.S., uh, personal care products and cosmetics are regulated by the FDA. Um, they're not tested by the U.S the FDA before they're sold. So if you buy, you know, toothpaste off the shelf, the FDA did not test that toothpaste um, or necessarily test all the ingredients in that toothpaste to make sure that they're safe before the toothpaste um, showed up on the, on the store shelf. Um, and they don't require specific tests to be done by companies to demonstrate safety of either individual products or ingredients. It's really up to the company to ensure safety of their products before they go to the market. Um, so what that means is here in the U.S. we only have 11 uh, chemicals that are either totally banned or they're restricted or limited 
um, in their use in cosmetics and personal care products. And then in Europe, there's 1,100 chemicals that are banned or limited, again, for use in, in personal care products specifically. Um, here in the U.S., uh, we have what's called the Cosmetics Ingredient Review Panel. So this is an industry-sponsored organization that reviews ingredient safety and then publishes its results um, online, it's open, peer-reviewed literature. You can go in and see uh, their review of certain ingredients. And then the FDA takes that, takes those um, co cosmetics ingredient review panel reviews, and takes the results of those to influence what, what chemicals are banned or what chemicals are limited. That's kind of the, the process here. That's how it works. Um, the FDA also does not have authority to recall products that contain a toxic chemical. So one example is Brazilian blowout. Um, some of you may have heard of this. So Brazilian blowout is a chemical hair straightener. So it's something that you would go to a salon to have your hair chemically straightened, not something that you would buy to use at home, something that you would, that you would only get from a, a professional. Um, so what happened is back in 2010, uh, salon workers were, started complaining of all these different health effects, breathing problems, headaches, dizziness, rashes, uh, et cetera, um, from this hair straightener. And they didn't know why. They didn't know what was causing uh, this issue. And then there was an investigation done that found that there was formaldehyde actually in the product. Um, we know formaldehyde is a carcinogen. It causes cancer. Um, so as all of this is going on, you know, OSHA gets involved. So the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they get involved going to the plants that are making the product. Um, the FDA, of course, is kind of involved because, you know, customers and, and salon workers are, are filing these complaints to the FDA. Um, and in the end, so kind of late 2011, uh, the FDA was able to send a warning letter to Brazilian Blowout saying that the product is adulterated and misbranded because it wasn't labeled as containing formaldehyde. And because it was a product that's used in salons, the salon workers have the right to know that there's formaldehyde in the product. So they weren't able to stop them from making the product. They weren't able to stop them from selling it. They weren't able to recall any products, any Brazilian blowout that was already in the marketplace. Um, that's the best that, that the FDA could do. And then OSHA actually cited four um, different companies in Florida that either manufactured or distributed um, formaldehyde-containing hair products. And, and that was kind of, kind of an aside, too, because it, they were able to cite them for failing to protect employees from formaldehyde exposure. So that's how they kind of got around it. So there was no real um, protection for, cus for customers or for the consumers or users of the product. Um, and there are currently no formal limits on formaldehyde um, that can be in uh, personal care products. So on average, uh, women in the U.S. use 12 different personal care products every day that have 168 um, different ingredients. Then men use six, so men use about half. Um, and teenage girls use about 17 products, so they're using more than women. Um, and 12 might sound like kind of a lot, but once you start really adding up all the products you use in the shower, um, if you're a, a woman and you wear a lot of cosmetics, you start adding up all your cosmetic products, even things like hand soap, toothpaste, mouthwash, um, all those products, once you really start adding them together, it's very easy to, to reach 12 um, products. 
And what's also surprising is that children are exposed to an average of 61 ingredients every day. If we think about how, how many fewer products they're using, um, but it's still 61 ingredients. It's still kind of a, a significant number. Um, this graphic shows the results of a survey of 2,000 women in the UK, in the United Kingdom, in November of 2009. So they asked these women, uh, what products do you use? What personal care products do you use every day? So the women um, submitted the, the name brand and the product that they used, and then they, they did some research to look and see how many chemicals are in this product, what are some of the health effects uh, resulting from this, the product also. Um, and they found, that the av they found the average woman puts on 515 chemicals every day. So there's 515 different chemicals um, in all the products that, that women put on their bodies each day. So there are a few of these that kind of stand out on the first one. Over here on the left in the very top is perfume. So the average number of chemicals is 250. That's by far the highest um, average number of chemicals. And the reason for that is the, the fragrance component itself, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if you notice, a lot of these are linked, uh, or the possible side effects they're linked to are hormone disruption, um, so talking about endocrine disruptors, fertility issues, problems with developing babies, uh, a lot of like skin irritation too, which is very ironic considering how these products are being used. I mean, they're meant, for the most part, they're meant to go on your skin and meant to be used on your skin. Uh, so that's, that's kind of surprising to me and, and obviously ironic um, as well. So some of the um, potential environmental effects that we have for some of these uh, personal care products, um, they end up in the environment when they're rinsed down the drain. You know, most of the products we use, especially in, in showers and bathing, you know, we just we shampoo our hair and just rinse it right down the drain. Um, and the challenge with that is that there are no municipal water treatment plants engineered to remove personal care product ingredients from water. So you rinse it down the drain, it goes to the water treatment plant, the water treatment plant can't remove it, and then it ends up in the environment. And then we're seeing that these ingredients do in fact end up in our water bodies. Um, we don't know how much harm they're causing. There's research going on now uh, to, to try to quantify that. Um, and it's also challenging because the concentrations are are relatively low. Um, but if you think about, you know, every person in America that takes a shower every day and all the products that, that we use and that we rinse down the drain, I mean, that adds up to, to a pretty significant quantity. And even products that you might think, you know, your skin absorbs things like lotions, um, your skin absorbs so much of that and then there's some that just kind of sits on top and even that gets kind of rinse down the drain as well and ends up in our water. So now we're going to go through some um, specific ingredients and kind of talk through where you can find them, why they're an issue, etc. Um, the pictures that you'll see on these slides coming up are sample products that we know contain the ingredient that's discussed on the slide. Um, and that's because it's on the ingredients list. So that's how I, I know that they're, they're actually in here. So the first one we have are parabens. So parabens are preservatives. Um, so you find them in a lot of water-based products. So products that you will use to wash with, products that are rinsed off your body. So like shampoo, other cleansers, um, conditioners, toothpaste, some cosmetics and makeup. Um, and they're linked to cancer, endocrine disruption, uh, those are kind of the, the two big ones, 
and you find them in a lot of products and you find them, usually there's more than one um, when you look on the ingredients list as well. And if you're, you're shopping and looking at, at ingredients lists, it won't just say paraben, it will say methyl paraben, ethyl paraben, you know, propyl paraben, it, it will have those pre, one of those prefixes uh, before it, but if it, if it, the word ends in paraben, then that's, that's a paraben that you have. Um, and then parabens have been found in breast tumors, but it's kind of unclear if their presence leads to cancer. There's some research going on now too, to try to figure that one out as well. Um, formaldehyde can also be used as a preservative itself. Um, but what you often find is that other preservatives can release formaldehyde once they're actually in the product. Uh, so the three that are underlined here on this slide under the look for, um, those are kind of the three most common ones that you might find. Um, about 20% of cosmetics and personal care products in the U.S. do contain some kind of formaldehyde releasing chemical. Um, you can see all the products that they have been found in. And then, of course, the, the biggest concern is that formaldehyde, we know, is a carcinogen. We know that it, it causes cancer. Um, the Cosmetics Ingredients Review Panel reviewed formaldehyde use in, in cosmetics and use in personal care products back in 1984. And their, their conclusion was that it's insufficient to conclude um, cosmetics applied to skin containing more than 0.2% formaldehyde are safe. Uh, so they're, they're unsure about the safety of products that contain formaldehyde. And then we have antimicrobials. So you find triclosan. triclosan uh, is what's typically in antibacterial soap. Um, so like that soft soap that's listed there or pictured there, the hand soap. Um, you find it in other um, face washes, especially face washes for acne. Um, and then a lot of, of toothpaste contain triclosan too. Um, so the concern with, with triclosan is really the emergence of um, bacteria that are resistant to these antibacterial products. So are we, by washing our hands with antibacterial soap, you know, are we creating these superbugs that are now resistant um, to that antibacterial soap? And what's interesting is that the U.S. FDA stance on antibacterial soap, hand soap specifically, has been that if you wash your hands well, so if you, you know, take the time to wash your hands, you scrub them really well, then there's no benefit of having triclosan in your soap. Really, washing with soap and water is sufficient. Um, so in last December, uh, they issued a proposed rule to require any manufacturer of antibacterial soaps and body washes to demonstrate that they're safe and that they're more effective. Uh, than regular soap and water. And if they can't, then they need to be reformulated, relabeled, they need to be to change um, to stay on the market. So that's, that's kind of interesting. We'll see how that um, plays out a little bit. But to find hand soap without triclosan is very easy. Um, you'll pay the same price. There's no real cost differential uh, between them. If you look on the label of soap, like hand soap, if you turn and look on the back, if it has triclosan, it will tell you what percent triclosan is in the product. Um, so that's an easy way to see if there's any triclosan at all. If it doesn't have that statement at the top, then there's no triclosan in it. Um, and if it says antibacterial, then it, it most likely does. I mean, so that's if you're just scanning shelves, that can be an easy way to kind of limit um, what what products you buy. And then the same thing for toothpaste. So if you're looking for a triclosan free toothpaste, um, on the box or on the container, it will always tell you what percent triclosan um, it, 
that's in it if it contains triclosan. Uh, if, in my own personal shopping, I've noticed that the big brands, um, they make some, some lines or some types that don't contain triclosan and others that do. So shopping by brand is not always the, the easiest way to shop, at least for toothpaste, because you can find kind of both within the brand. So it, it does mean you have to read a label to identify one. Um, and fragrance. So we have fragrance that adds sense to cosmetics, adds sense to personal care products. Um, this is a blend of chemicals, so it could be thousands of chemicals, because uh, the composition doesn't have to be disclosed on the label. If you were on our cleaning products webinar, we talked about fragrance a lot um, there. So we're talking about the same thing. You know, you'll read like a shampoo bottle, anything that, that has any kind of scent to it, and it will just list fragrance um, most of the time as the ingredient. If it says that, then there's most likely a phthalate um, in that fragrance. Um, it's, you also find phthalates in nail polish and moisturizers. So we'll talk about nail, nail polish in a little bit, but you find them in moisturizers as well. And their uh, biggest concern is they're linked to endocrine disruption, so risks to, to the reproductive system. That's kind of the, the biggest concern. And because they're so prevalent. Um, same thing with synthetic musks. Um, they're also linked to endocrine disruption. Uh, this um, not so sexy report that's pictured here. So this was done by the Environmental Working Group and Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. And they tested 17 name brand fragrances, so perfumes. They pulled them off the shelf in 2010 and they found um, 24 sensitizers, 12 hormone disrupting chemicals, and 38 chemicals. They were able to detect 38 chemicals that weren't listed on the label. So perfumes or, or anything that's really just a fragrance product, some body sprays, uh, those are usually have some pretty uh, not so good chemicals um, in them. So some things, some things you can do for fragrance, you can find unscented or, or fragrance free, I should say, products, um, products that don't have fragrance listed, um, or products that, that have a natural scent to them. Um, some brands are starting to do that and actually use real, um, real things that, that exist in nature to scent their products as well. Um, propylene glycol is commonly used as a skin conditioner. It can also be used as a fragrance ingredient. Um, it, it provides moisture, so it can be a lot of moisturizing products. And um, we know it's a skin irritant. It's kind of iffy if it's expected to be toxic or harmful or if it's really safe in cosmetics, um, but it's also a penetration enhancer. So that means it makes it easier for other chemicals that are in that product to get into your skin. So really it's looking at what other chemicals are being used in that product um, because is it making it easier for, for some other not so good chemicals to, to kind of get into your body. Um, Anti-dandruff products and also um, hair dye or hair, hair colors um, can contain coal tar. So it's an active ingredient in over-the-counter products. So things like this uh, tea gel shampoo that's shown there, um, any, anything for psoriasis or a lot of products for psoriasis will contain it. Um, and the big concern with, with coal tar is that we know that it's a carcinogen. We know that it, it leads to cancer. Um, it's also linked to some of these other effects, endocrine disruption, reproductive toxicity, et cetera. Um, so how do you know if something contains coal tar? 
if it if it does, it has to have a percent concentration on the label. So like the shampoo that's pictured here, if you were to look on, on the back of the label, it will tell you a percentage, uh, probably between 0.5 and 5%, uh, but it will be listed as the percentage on there. Um, hair dye. Uh, if your hair dye contains coal tar, it must have a warning label that says, this product contains an ingredient determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. So if your hair dye or hair color has that statement on there, then you know that it contains coal tar. Um, and then colorants. So metals are usually uh, used to give both cosmetics and personal care products color. Um, this chart here shows the results of a May 2011 study of 49 different cosmetics um, for different heavy metals. So they looked at foundation, concealer, powder, blush, mascara, eyeliner, eyeshadow, lipstick, etc. And then you can see how many products actually contain uh, these different metals. Um, so 100% or all 49 you know, contain nickel, um, and of course, the, the potential effects range significantly. Um, and, and the potential effects are based on the amount that you're exposed to, right? So this just shows uh, the products that contain the metal and what the potential effects are with, with a high dose. Um, I, I don't have uh, the information that shows exactly how much was in each one and if if it, the potential effects are really um, going to occur based on that amount. But kind of interesting to see that even 96% of them, they could detect some amount of lead. You know, same thing for um, cadmium. Half of them contained some uh, amount of cadmium. They were able to identify that cadmium was, was in the product. I get a lot of questions about lipstick and lead. Um, back in 2010, the FDA uh, did a survey of 400 different lipsticks. So they pulled 400 lipsticks off the shelf. Uh, the two that are shown here on the, on the slide, so the Clinique um, is the lowest. So that was the product they identified with the, the smallest. Um, amount of lead, and then that Maybelline Color Sensational is the one with the highest um, concentration of lead. So the FDA limit for lead in colorants in cosmetics is typically 20 um, parts per million, so that's just a, a concentration or how much lead can, can be in the product. Um, so you can see that even the Maybelline, although it was the highest, it's at 7 um, parts per million, so that's significantly less than the 20, which is the, the limit. Um, and then these are kind of the official statements from the FDA and the CDC, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, you know, about lead levels found in the lipsticks, are they of concern? Um, and, and according to the FDA, they're saying that no, there's no real concern, uh, that it's ingested in very small quantities. The, the limits or the levels that they found are within the limits that were that are recommended. And then one thing to think about though are young children and you know lead in in cosmetics marketed for young kids um, and young girls especially that there's been no uh, safe level for lead that's been identified so maybe restricting um, your children from putting on your lipstick or their, you know, play lipstick, um, understanding that, that there, there could be lead in that lipstick. If you're interested in um, the results of the survey, I mean, they list all 400 lipsticks and what the concentration, concentration um, is. You can go online and find that. You could Google it. It's very easy to find. But just a caveat that this is now four years old. Um, so I'm sure that uh, much of that data has probably changed as, um, as manufacturers reformulate products as well. 
Some other things that might be in lipstick, you know, or that we know is in lipstick besides lead, uh, it contains wax, oils, moisturizers. Um, so the wax is there for structure, right? That's really what keeps it as a, a lipstick. Um, about 50% of lipstick that's made in the U.S. contains either pig fat or castor oil. So it's at, the oils and fats are there for shine, to make your lips nice and shiny. Um, and then the colorants are usually a blend of reds, and then pinks are made from blending red with titanium dioxide. So titanium dioxide is, is used as a white, so that's kind of how you get the pink. Um, so matte lipstick, so lipstick that's not shiny, you know, usually contains some kind of filling agent like silica, uh, something that's cream, has more wax than oils in it. Um, things that are sheer or long-lasting have a lot of oil in them. And then lipstick that's shimmery can contain uh, mica, silica, fish scales, or synthetic pearl particles, or you know, other products or other ingredients like that that kind of give it the, that shimmery effect. So some other, other ingredients besides um, um, lead that, that might be not so great too. Uh, antiperspirant and deodorant um, usually contains aluminum. Uh, there's some kind of controversial research around uh, using antiperspirant or deodorant with aluminum and a link to breast cancer, uh, and also, you know, the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's. So neither one of those have, have been proven. Uh, but there are alternatives. You know, you can find aluminum-free products. You can find products with reduced aluminum content. These are all on the slide. The pictures are examples of um, men's and women's antiperspirants and deodorants and the percent um, aluminum that they contain. Uh, so you can see that those range uh, significantly. I thought it was kind of interesting myself. I thought they, the ones marketed as like the clinical um, protection or, you know, the ones that say the strongest you can get without a prescription, I assume that those would have the highest concentration of aluminum and that's not always the case, as you can see, the Dove clinical protection actually has less than just your, your basic suave or even the Toms of Maine. Um, so there are alternatives out there. If you look at the, the label of deodorant or antiperspirant, it will always tell you what percent. Um, if it contains aluminum, it will tell you what percent of that aluminum um, ingredient is in there right on the top of the label. So that's a one way to shop. I've noticed some um, manufacturers that are making aluminum free deodorant are making it because it's aluminum free and because that's what consumers want. So they're advertising that right on the front of the, the label. So like the Jason brand that's there all the way on the left and the Kiss My Face that's next to it. I believe both of those even say on the front like paraben free, aluminum free, uh, the Jason you can see is also fragrance free. Um, so some some brands are starting to really recognize that this is what what some customers want. And customers are asking for, so they're formulating their products differently and advertising them differently as well. Um, nail polish can contain what's affectionately known as the toxic trio. So this is a phthalate, so it's dibutyl phthalate. Um, toluene and formaldehyde again and um, you can read there kind of the different issues with um, each of them so the one phthalate is prohibited in cosmetics in Europe because uh, it's linked to you know reproductive and developmental issues um, and the reason why it's there is that it adds flexibility so if you have like long wearing nail polish nail pol polish that says it won't chip um, it probably has more phthalate in it because it's actually making it flexible. So when your nail flexes and bends, um, the nail polish flexes with it instead of chipping off. Uh, same 
well, similar for tolling weave. So you have a long last or a long wear. Um, it's going to help the, the color stay there and make a nice smooth finish. Um, and then you find formaldehyde and nail hardeners also. So if you see the picture of the one here, it says in small letters, three free nail lacquer. Um, that's kind of the, the language to look for. Anything that, that says it's three free. Um, there are a lot of brands, a lot of big brands have gone three free. Uh, so there, this slide has examples of some of those. So Sally, OPI, um, Revlon. I mean, um, and if companies have gone three free, they're very open about it. They know that's what customers are looking for. So it'll either be on their packaging or on their website. But then there are other ingredients of concern as well. Uh, nail polish is really not very good, even when it doesn't contain the toxic trio. Um, so it can contain you know, organic solvents, things like xylene, methyl ethyl ketone, acetone. So acetone is also what you find in um, nail polish remover. Um, acrylic nails. So you have the methyl methacrylate, ethyl methacrylate, um, some issues with those. Both human health effects and um, effects on the environment. I mean, some of these are toxic to fish, or if they're very persistent in the air, that means they're, they're staying in the air for a very long time. So you have that smell when you're painting your nails, right? Everybody, most women kind of know that smell when they're they're painting their nails. Well, a lot of those chemicals are, are in the air, and now they're hanging out in the air for a long time because they're so persistent. And then um, benzyl acetate as well to prevent chipping. So you find a, a lot of different um, chemicals that, that can also be um, in nail polish. And, a, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is that Yes, you breathe in the fumes when you're painting your nails and when you're actually applying nail polish, but the polish actually does go through your nail bed. So it goes through your fingernails and, and enters your bloodstream. So you're kind of getting it um, from both ways. You're breathing it in and it's kind of soaking in and, and soaking through as well. And then just an, an update on um, sunscreen. So you may have noticed if you bought sunscreen last summer, if you've gone on a trip recently to somewhere warmer than here, um, that sunscreen labels and packaging has, has changed a bit. Um, it changed starting really last summer. Um, so now you see that it will tell you uh, how long a sunscreen is water resistant for. It will tell you that right on the front. It will tell you what the active ingredients are in the back. Um, and it will tell you how frequently do you need to reapply. Um, so actually it's a good thing because it, it we should really be reapplying sunscreen a lot more frequently, I think, than most of us do. Um, so this just kind of reinforces um, safe sunscreen use when we should really be, be using it. Um, so just some, some tips for sunscreen, especially as we start to get into kind of the summer season and, and everybody's starting to get excited about being outside. Um, sprays and powders. So those are, aren't the best because now you have tiny particles uh, that you could breathe in. Um, so trying to avoid those. Avoiding vitamin A or retinal palmitate, um, choosing zinc or titanium uh, instead as kind of your active ingredient. Um, again, reapplying things often because it breaks down in the sun, washes off, um, etc. So this is the Environmental Working Group's um, Guide to Sunscreens. So every year um, they come out with a new Guide to Sunscreen. So it's the sunscreens that are available that year. And usually it comes out in mid-May, just about the time everybody's getting ready for the summer. Uh, and they rate the, both the safety, so they're looking at the, the safety of the ingredients, but also the effectiveness. 
um, of SPF products. So you can see here where it says pick the best beach and sports sunscreen moisturizers with the SPF, lip balms, makeup, etc. Um, so you can go in and you can click on it and you can see what is the best uh, sunscreen, both in terms of health effects of the ingredients and in terms of effectiveness against UVA, UVB uh, radiation as well. So it's kind of a, a neat tool to use to help when shopping for sunscreens. Um, children's personal care products. So in 2007, uh, there was a survey done of 3,300 parents to see what personal care products their children use. And they found that infants are exposed to 45 chemicals every day, uh, which as a mother myself it is pretty surprising to me because if you think about infants, um, they're not really using many products. I mean, infants um, may take a bath with pro usually one product. Uh, there's probably diaper wipes or, you know, wipes. And um, there may be a diaper cream, and maybe that's it. There may be a, a, a lotion as well. Um, but to have 45 chemicals in just those few products is, is pretty significant. And then 40% of those ingredients have, have not been kind of found safe for kids. So no one's really studied them to look and see what is their effect on, on children and, and kids specifically. Um, and then you can read the rest, you know, how that a significant number um, of, of infants are exposed to ingredients linked to brain and nervous system damage, endocrine disruption, cancer, um, and that a little less than half, 40% of products worn to keep out of reach of children. You know, so something that we're actually putting on our children's bodies and using on our children worn to keep us, to keep them away from it. Kind of ironic also. Um, Johnson & Johnson's baby shampoo, so kind of your, your classic what everybody uses uh, for, for their babies. Um, back in March of 2009, uh, the Compact for Safe Cosmetics found that the baby shampoo contains two cancer-causing chemicals. So what they found is that it contains the quaternium-15, which is one of those formaldehyde-releasing um, preservatives, and that's what was happening, is that they were finding formaldehyde in the shampoo. And then it also contained 1,4-dioxane in the product as well. Um, so in October, it took them until October of 2011 for Johnson & Johnson to say they would commit to phasing out those preservatives from baby products. And then January of this year uh, said that the preservatives will be replaced and that you'll start seeing uh, new product, new formulation on store shelves in the first half of 2014. Uh, personally, I've already seen it out in a couple stores. Um, and it surprisingly doesn't say new formulation on the front. You actually have to um, read the ingredients list. So this is a great graphic. This was published in the New York Times uh, in January. And you see the, the version on the top that's the old formulation that contains the quaternium 15. And then the new formulation on the bottom doesn't. It has some other ingredients that they've, they've added and replaced instead. So if you see that quaternium 15, then you know you have the old formulation. Um, if you don't see it, then you have the new formulation. Now what was ironic about all of this, you know, as kind of the Compact for Safe Cosmetics and other groups started um, pressuring Johnson & Johnson to change their shampoo, um, they already make Johnson's Natural, so this Johnson's Natural line that's shown down here in the bottom right, um, which does not contain uh, any formaldehyde-releasing preservatives, you know, no traces of this 1,4-dioxane, um, was a much, much better product. So that product was already available um, and, and already out. It's just that most people um, use kind of the, the classic um, baby shampoo. That's, that's a good thing that, that they were able to change that. Um, in terms of environmental impact, so now we have used these products. 
Uh, we rinse them down the drain. You know, a lot of them take a long time to break down into their non-toxic counterparts. Um, so here's some of the, the chemicals. And you can see how long it takes for them to be removed from water. That This is all in days. Um, how long to be removed from sediment, so if it actually, you know, makes it down into sediment um, in a lake or a stream. And then if, how toxic it is to fish. So you have triclosan, that was the ingredient in our antibacterial um, hand soap, takes almost a year to be removed from water. And that's just imagine washing your hands, you know, once. Now it's going to sit in, in water somewhere for a year. And it's going to sit in sediment for almost nine years. So see, a lot of these take a long time to break down. I mean, even taking um, three months, methylparaben, one of the preservatives, and formaldehyde, um, taking three months to be, be removed. And a lot of these are also toxic to fish. So the whole time for that year that triclosan is sitting in the water, um, it's, it's affecting the fish. I mean, while it's there, fish are being exposed to it, fish are ingesting it. Um, for those 8.8 .8 years that it's sitting in sediment, same thing. Um, fish are, are being exposed to it and ingesting it, so now you're, you're having issues with, with fish as well. So not just health effects, so, you know, a lot of environmental effects from these products too. Uh, the use of most um, Eco-friendly terms are not defined or regulated. So if you see a product that just says it's natural, it's eco-friendly, it's environmentally preferable, it's non-toxic, um, there's, nothing, there's nothing behind that claim. Um, things that are preferable, if you see the USDA organic seal, if you see this USDA um, certified bio-based product, uh, so the bio-based product is a new one that I'm starting to see a lot more, more often. And it looks at the, it could be the ingredients or the package. So they have a different label that's certified bio-based package. Um, and it's how, it's the percentage of ingredients uh, that are, are derived from a biological substance. So something that's natural. Um, and then it will tell you a percentage. Like this example one here shows product 57%. So 57% of the ingredients are derived from a biological source. So something to think about as you're, you're purchasing products. Um, so some alternatives. There are some things you can do. You know, buying things that are, are free of some of these ingredients. Um, and the price does vary. There are some great cost competitive alternatives to you can pay significantly more depending on the brand and depending on on how green if you will you go and then I found performance will vary uh, from better I mean some products that I have are work a lot better uh, than kind of their conventional kind of parts others not so much it's like any product that you buy and consider that products without these ingredients can perform differently. So something that's, that's fragrance-free, I mean, is not going to have a scent to it. And, and that might, might take a little bit to get over the fact that maybe your shampoo or your hair, you know, doesn't have a, a smell to it. Um, or one thing we didn't talk about, but sulfates. So if you buy uh, sulfate-free products, um, so those are usually shampoos or body washes. They're not going to foam the same way. So you're not going to have a whole head of foam when you're shampooing with a sulfate-free shampoo. Uh, so, and that's something that we're used to. We're used to, oh, the shampoo must work really well because it's foaming up really nicely. And if it doesn't, just kind of getting over the, the psychological um, Concern that yes, it's still working even though it's it maybe feels a little bit different than what we're used to And then think if ingredients are necessary, you know, does your soap have to be antimicrobial? Uh, does your face soap have to be pH balanced? Does the scent really matter? Could you go to something that's that's fragrance free or has more of a natural scent to it? Um, you know same thing with deodorant or antiperspirant with lower levels of aluminum or aluminum-free. 
Uh, a lot of them are cost competitive, and you, you might have performance of products with less aluminum. I mean, the aluminum is there to stop the flow of sweat. So it's obviously going to perform differently if you go to something with less aluminum or something with no aluminum. Um, so just being a little bit prepared for that and, and understanding there might be a little bit of trial and error with, with different products. And then nail polish. Uh, if you are a, a nail polish where, you know, going without the, the toxic trio, um, again, these are very cost competitive. Uh, and then they function as good as, if not better than polish um, that does have these ingredients. So some other things you can do, um, eliminating products that are just unnecessary. You know, if you have things that you really don't need to be using, um, just eliminating them. Prioritizing high exposure or frequently used products for replacement. I get a lot of questions you know, people ask, well, okay, now I need to go home and buy all new products. I mean, that's not realistic. I, you know, can't spend a lot of money and, and trying to identify things that are right. Well, if you have products that are, are high exposure, so things that you put on your skin that stay on your skin, and then they're frequently used, maybe something like a body lotion, if you use a body lotion every day, or a face moisturizer every day, something that, that gets used frequently, and sits on your skin, that's kind of the, the first thing to find a replacement for. And then kind of make a list and, and kind of go down the list um, and, and slowly replace things if, if that's, you know, a little bit easier to do. Um, choosing organic products, buying from companies that you trust, that's one way to shop, is to find companies themselves uh, that you like their philosophy, you like the ingredients that they use, and you can just purchase from the same company every time. Um, you can make your own products. We here have tried a few recipes for things like lip balm and body lotion and sugar scrub, so body scrub, um, and you can very easily make your own products, and a lot of them work really well, too. And then there are some tools. So I'm going to, the last in the next five minutes, we'll go through a couple tools uh, to help you actually choose safer products. So what exists out there to help you? Um, the three I'm going to talk about are the California Safe Cosmetics Program Product Database. Uh, you guys don't have to rush to write these down because I'll make sure that everybody gets um, the slides. Uh, the Good Guide, the Skin Deep Database. Um, and then if you're just interested in about ingredients or the industry itself, uh, there's the link for the cosmetics ingredient review. Um, FDA has a nice cosmetics um, page, so they have all their regulatory information is there, and there's some safety information on some ingredients. And then this campaign for safe cosmetics is also a good um, resource. So the California Safe Cosmetics Program product database um, exists because there's an act in California that requires companies to report cosmetic products um, that contain ingredients known or suspected to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. Um, so you can go in here, you can search for an ingredient, you can in search for a company or a product, um, and then you can see if any uh, ingredients are linked to products. So for an example, here's Dove uh, soap, just a bar of white Dove soap. Um, and then here's the one ingredient that's reported for this product. It's titanium dioxide. You can actually click on the titanium dioxide and it'll pull up information. Uh, it'll pull up health and safety information about titanium dioxide, so why is it listed? Um, and what's interesting is that titanium dioxide is listed because when it's in a form that can be breathed in, it is a carcinogen. Um, obviously, we're not breathing in bars of Dove's Hope when we're at home, but that's why uh, titanium dioxide is listed. It's on one of the, the California lists, so that's why it shows up there. Um, good Guide. So Good Guide is really a, a way to help you kind of shop and compare ratings of products. Um, 
There's personal care products. There's other consumer products. You can see across the top here the different product categories, so personal care, food, household, et cetera. Uh, you can, again, search by product type, search by company, ingredients. Um, you can type in the exact name of a product and see if a rating comes up. And then a product will have a rating. So it will rate the health, environment, and society um, of that product. So the rating system is 0, worst, 10, best. Uh, so here's what Dove soap looks like in Good Guide. Uh, so again, you see kind of the three components here. There's health. So health uh, always relates to the ingredients themselves. So are there any ingredients that have concerns associated with them? And what are they? So here are the three ingredients um, that have a low level uh, of concern. And similar to the California database, you can click on the ingredient and read more information um, on what the concerns might be. And then down here, there's an environment score and a society score, and you can expand these as well. Uh, but these are related to the company itself. So who is it? Unilever that makes Dove. Um, and it will rate their, the company's environmental policies, company's social policies. So those three components of the score, the health, environment, and society, make up this, this kind of master scientific rating, if you will. So that's, that's a good guide and kind of how good guide works. Now, if you just wanted, let's say instead of looking up Dove soap, you just wanted to find a new soap, um, you can go up here to the top to personal care, click on this. Uh, it probably says bar soap or, well, bath, uh, shower and soap, bar soap, and then it will list um, best to worst or worst to best. And you can kind of shop that way, which is, is very handy, very useful. Oh, and I should mention that Good Guide does have a mobile app. So if you want to download it for your cell phone, and they have both iPhone and Android available, and they both have bar scanners too. Um, same thing for the Environmental Working Group Skin Deep uh, Cosmetics Database. Also has a app with a barcode reader for both iPhone and Android. Um, so this is very similar, but it's very similar to Good Guide but it's only limited to um, personal care products. You can read the, the categories across the top. So sun, makeup, skin care, hair, nails, fragrance, etc. cetera. Um, you can search in the same way. So you can search for a specific product. You can search for an ingredient. Um, you could just search for a product type. So you could search um, probably skin care, bar soap, and then it'll list all the bar soaps from, from best to worst or worst to best. Um, and their rating system is flipped from Good Guide. It's, it, zero is best, 10 is worst. But they're color coded, uh, similar to Good Guide, so green, um, green, yellow, red, so green is best, yellow in the middle, red is the worst. So here's what you see um, for Dove in Skin Deep. And, and Skin Deep only looks at the health concerns or health effects. Uh, associated with the ingredients. So the whole piece around environmental policies, social policies that you find in Good Guide is not included um, in Skin Deep. So the first thing you see over here on the left, you see an overall score. Again, 0 to 10, 0 being best, 10 being worst. So there's kind of the overall score for the product. Then you see this ingredient concern summary over here to the right. So you can see kind of the overall hazard, cancer, developmental, reproductive tox, allergies and immunotox, and use restrictions. And then if you keep going down below, you'll see every ingredient listed uh, from the package, what the concerns are with that ingredient and the ingredient score itself. Um, so very helpful. You can click on uh, the ingredient, and you can get even more information. You can get all the uh, scientific um, uh, references that went into this for fragrance or for any of the ingredients to see, well, where, you know, why does this say ecotoxicology? Where did this come from? Who, who decided that, that it's, it's ecotoxic? So just to show you a little bit more, here's um, a continuation of that ingredients list. 
So you still have the fragrance at the top and then kind of the rest. And I had to cut it off just so it could, could fit on the slide. But all the ingredients will be listed. And they're listed here from worst to best. Um, so not, not from a quantity uh, perspective like you see on the product label itself, but just from, from worst to best. Okay, so that uh, wraps us up for today 